Hello and welcome to uh, CIO Net Live, uh, hosted alongside our friends at uh, Avenard. Um, before I hand over to Roger um, to introduce you to our speakers, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. I just wanted to go through a couple of house rules, um, of which our uh, admin team can obviously help with. Uh, so with all CIO Net events, uh, what we do, just so we can see who we're speaking to, because it very much is a a knowledge and experience exchange uh, we just would like to show our our first name and company name in our tile which you can change in the rename it might be happening for you already but if not if you could uh, have a look into that um with regards to uh, the question and answer session as it says there you can, uh, feel free to to raise your hand which is a function within zoom uh, or you alternatively ask your questions in uh, in chat and uh, as it says there, even though we're under strict Chatham House rules, those that aren't able to join us as people in the network who have applied to join, we will be sharing certain parts of the video with them afterwards. But please feel free to be as open and honest as possible. Um, there is also the functionality to switch between the, um, the speaker view and, and the guest view um, uh, throughout. So feel free to, to do that. Um, once I hand over to Roger, uh, he'll, as I say, he'll introduce us to the speakers, but um, one of the things that we do for each CIO Net event to obviously help improve uh, the sessions as they go along and improve the member experience is that we uh, send out a short questionnaire, which is done via text and uh, email uh, towards the end of the event, where we're asking people to vote for the most valuable participant. And obviously everyone uh, would obviously contribute towards that. But if you can have a look at that when that when that comes out, I'll make another announcement at the end for that. Um, it's quick and easy and 100% and, uh, secure. Um, the most valuable participant will then be able to give a charitable donation on behalf of CIO Net to a charity of their choosing, uh, which is great. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, I was going to hand over to, to Roger shortly, but I'm not sure if, if the participants that have joined us so far, some are still joining us, but if we wanted to give uh, a round robin of introductions of people. So I am Sean Foley, I'm co-director and lead uh, for CIO Net UK. And uh, if Roger, if you can introduce yourself as well, that'd be superb. Yes, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm Roger Camras, uh, again, co-director, co-founder of CIO Net in the UK. Um, Sean, over to you, I guess, uh, Mike Pittman, if he could introduce himself first, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mike Pittman. I'm the uh, head of Instant Response at BAT. If you could just unmute, David. Hi, I'm... Hi there, all, sorry, all participants should be unmuted now. So uh, feel free to uh, uh, give a short introduction of yourself. Uh, so I don't know if we're going to pick up with David again. Having a little Hi, problem. can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic, David, go ahead. <laughs> Technical problem. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, I'm David Henderson. I'm the IT director of Leicester College. We're one of the largest colleges in the Midlands, currently locked down. <laughs> probably most of you heard but we got about 26,000 students and 3,000 staff so we're a reasonable size organization. Wow big one. Uh, Matt, Matt Holland please. Uh, we, know, we know your company well yes. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, most of you all know me one way or another. Um, uh, so Matt Holland I'm 
I'm uh, an independent interim CISO, uh, currently at John Lewis, uh, covering John Lewis and Waitrose. Fantastic, thank you. I hope you could deliver our uh, poo next week. I'm a fan. <laughs> You're doing a good job, by the way. Paul, Paul Ledger. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, Paul Ledger. Uh, I'm part of AXA Excel, which is one of the uh, one of the large transnational opcos as part of AXA. Um, so that's about 160,000 users on a global basis. Um, so I'm, I'm part of the CTO office within AXA Excel. I'm an enterprise security and infrastructure architect. Andy from the Tegra. Hi, Roger. Good to see you. Um, you Andy Jeffries here, um, Chief Innovation Officer at Integra. Uh, we're a challenger IT consultant firm, uh, actually building a lot of um, digital workplace apps for large enterprises, um, hence my interest. Excellent. Gareth uh, from McCann. Hello, everybody. I'm Gareth Bruce, I'm the IT Director. Um, for compliance at McCann World Group, we're a large advertising group, about 25,000 people worldwide. Excellent. Welcome. Uh, Pablo. Pablo. Hi, I'm Pablo Baudicar, uh, Head of Architecture at uh, Kiwi Insurance, a uh, very similar industry, I think, to Paul. <laughs> Fine. And Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Holin. I'm an interim IT lead. I've recently just finished at W.A. Smith, uh, whereas uh, helping reorganize the IT group, including security, uh, amongst other things, as well as moving to a more enterprise model. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for attending. And uh, oh, we want to just now introduce our main speaker. Uh, we're really delighted to have Richard Maudling join us tonight. I suppose Rich has been involved in one of the most epic uh, journeys on the planet, uh, helping to um, migrate 100,000 workers at Unilever from their offices, their comfortable offices, uh, to their homes. Uh, he had three days to do that, so uh, that's quite a challenging uh, episode, and I'm sure many of you will have some sympathy with what he's achieved uh, in that period of time. And it's not just what he achieved then, but what have the repercussions been in the last six months uh, in terms of just stabilizing the distributed workforce and then particularly what the next six months may hold for us uh, as we move into hopefully a post-COVID era. So Richard, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our event and uh, please describe what, you're, what you've been up to. Okay, thank you. Um, can everybody see my screen or what do I need to do to? Not yet. You, have you got the share, share the screen? <coughs> you had it before. Oh, that's great. Excellent. So hopefully you can see the full screen rather than the, uh, the, the presenter. Okay. Um, so I'm Richard Mardley. I'm the, um, uh, I'm an interim. Although I've been here now nearly two years, um, I'm the global I IDAM director, so responsible for anything for um, identity and access management related um, around the world. So, um, so yes, I'm not going to talk too much about what we're doing overall in, in Unilever, but more um, as uh, um, Roger mentioned earlier on, more about what we did to sort of move the company very quickly from working in the office. Uh, to working from home. But to begin with, um, just a few numbers, um, just so you can get some idea of uh, what we do within um, at Unilever. So uh, within the IDAM space, Identity Directory and Access Management is how uh, Unilever uh, used the, uh, the acronym uh, I've got three services, um, authentication, to do with logging in, um, single sign-on, uh, cyber uh, privileged access management certificate services all fit in there. Um, we have something like in excess of 500 applications that run through single sign-on currently, um, well over a million single sign-on sessions a day are all going through, through that. Um, in there, we've got over 150,000 users. 
Um, uh, they're the ones that we manage. Um, the second service that we have is around identity management, which is obviously the, the creation, the changing, the removal, uh, the monitoring um, of, uh, of our users. And that's, that covers um, employees, it covers contractors, it covers third parties. Um, and so in there, we've got around about 150,000 um, altogether, 130,000 managed currently in MIM. Um, each month, we take away about 4,000 accounts and we grant about 4,000 accounts. So some of our sync processes are quite uh, extensive. Um, the balance is about 80 odd thousand. Um, if I got to it, my numbers won't quite add up, but there's around about 80 odd thousand um, employees. There's about 26, 27,000 contractors in there. And then the balance is made up with third parties. Um, we use a tool that we've, uh, a service that we got from Avenard that we uh, jointly developed with them. Uh, it's called ACAM and that's to manage all our uh, third party access uh, where we utilize um, the guest account capability within Azure AD um, and since launch uh, back in uh, December last year uh, 11,000 know, I, I checked the numbers earlier on and we're now up to 11,900 and this is these are for third parties who are self-registering or have been invited in and from there they're invited in and they can um, work with collaborate with colleagues in teams sharepoint onedrive uh, etc um, and that we noticed um, when we looked at the numbers and the uptake there was a significant uh, increase um, in uptake in march and april and then we've gone back to what we believe is the regular uptake from there and then um, our external access um, is the third service that we run um, and external access is anything coming into the network. So it's not just about third parties. Um, the v we've got, just got the VPN where we have to deal with um, over 100,000 users and there's over 30,000 concurrent sessions at any one point in time during the day. Uh, we have a tool, uh, we have a Zero App Proxy. We've got 100,000 users coming through there for whatever it means and over 400 applications available through that. And then our Citrix service, um, yeah, as you say, 350 servers. We've actually slimmed it down from 629 servers just running our Citrix service. Um, and at any one point in time, there'll be 8,000 people on there and a quarter of a million SAP sessions a, a month going through. So it just gives you an idea of um, the scale that we're working at across 170 odd countries with about uh, 26, I think, official languages that we have to work to. Obviously, at the uh, turn of the year, the news was coming out around um, coronavirus, as it was known as at the time in China, and um, what was happening in, in Wuhan. Um, so, pretty quickly, Unilever set up an incident management team that was looking at that pulled together people from uh, our medical people, our supply chain and everything else. It was looking at um, how would we react to, how would we as Unilever react and deal with uh, coronavirus. Um, I, we got pulled in there probably early to mid January <clears throat> and then we were told that um, we asking our colleagues in China, of which we've got 5,000 people uh, in China, to work from home. So all of a sudden we needed to uh, revisit our, um, our installation, our, our post installation, and a little bit of missed out. So back in January, we had um, capacity for 17,500 concurrent users. Um, across gateways in Shanghai, Australia, Singapore, um, Germany, the UK and North America. Um, and then what well, the licenses were spread out across those hubs um, to, based upon when we expected load at particular points in time. So over a weekend, we uh, doubled the capacity in Shanghai as the um, 
all 5,000 were going, uh, were going to be working from home. So we doubled it from two and a half to 5,000 overnight. So that was that sorted and we rebalanced across the remaining hubs. We then started to see that um, other countries, uh, the, the, the local IMTs were, were asking their, um, uh, <clears throat> their staff to work from home. So again, another rebalancing uh, took place where we'd still got 5,000 running in um, Shanghai, but we needed to move capacity towards uh, Singapore because of many of the countries that were working from home at the time were in the Far East. Um, but we also increased our capacity to go from 17,500 to 25,000 because we obviously still have people um, operating uh, in the old normal, let's call it, um, in terms of hubs through in Germany from the UK uh, and, and in the US. And clearly, as the news was happening and uh, we were hearing of you know, um, coronavirus in, in Italy, um, the tension started to sort of ratchet up a little bit. So we started to plan uh, in early March for uh, to work from home and we were expecting it to happen end of March, uh, sort of third, fourth week of March is when we were expecting it to happen. So we'd started to put some loose plans together and um, we were going to put it through a um, what would be uh, for us an accelerated project, but the typical steps that we would go through. Uh, anyway, we were called together on the Thursday afternoon to be told that on uh, the following morning an announcement was going out to say that as of Tuesday morning, the whole company worldwide would be working from home. So I was going from a um, 5,000 people in China plus a few countries in the Far East to the whole company over the weekend. And we had to then go from a capacity of um, dealing with, as I said, a maximum of 25,000 to we didn't know how many would be logging in. So we needed to build capacity really, really quickly. So um, we went to, uh, we got a load of uh, Azure data centers. So uh, incredibly quickly, we had the design approved, uh, the servers built, and then by Saturday afternoon, I think they built their first, the first instance. They didn't like it. They tore it down. They rebuilt it. They tested it. They didn't like it. They tore it down. And so by Sunday lunchtime, uh, we've now got the capacity to go to 42,000 concurrent worldwide. Um, and we're ready to go by <clears throat> Monday morning. And it was because we were able to use Azure and to get that capacity stood up so quickly that allowed us to get there. Um, we also increased a bunch of the, the capacity, especially in the UK, into the UK hubs because we still wanted to, uh, those to, uh, uh, to be ha um, in use. And we were desperately trying to work out how to balance across the different hubs and so that if a somebody in Australia connected and they couldn't connect into Singapore then which was their next hub that they should go to and we were pushing them into into the Azure hub. Um, the following you know, sure enough by Tuesday morning everybody was working from home and then we, Tuesday was a bit hairy. Um, we, we, uh, we got through Tuesday um, without too many glitches there were, there were a few it was mainly because um, of the short notice that people had that uh, they hadn't got the files with them on their laptops. They were on file service somewhere. And so I've learned a new term called hairpinning. So um, you could be based in, say, Istanbul, and you're routed, your VPN is routed via uh, to Azure in Amsterdam, at which point you're onto our internal network, at which point you're back over the MPLS into um, a file server in Istanbul to get hold of a four gigabyte um, Excel file and haul it all the way back, which um, I'll come on to shortly. So uh, there were a number of things to be sorted out, mainly around file shares um, that we were dealing with. And then um, the following week, we were, um, to, use, to, coin a, uh, to use a phrase, we were fixing forward. There were different, some things that we didn't get right. We didn't get some of the routing right in the Azure Hub, 
but by but after a week, just over a week after being told, can you uh, move the whole workforce on uh, online? We had them um, we had them online. <clears throat> what we then decided to do was build another hub. Uh, once we'd stabilised the service, build another hub in. Um, the first one was in Dublin. The next one we built it in Amsterdam. Uh, we uplifted some of the bandwidth, and now we have balance, and we can uh, balance people across countries, across the hubs. And how we um, the deal that we did uh, with Pulse is on a pay-as-you-go basis, so that we haven't bought a fixed license. We we bought we pay, uh, at the end of each month we total up how many licenses were used in the month and then we pay for that and that um, and we're now trying to drive our costs down but we went from as you can see on the screen capacity for seventeen and a half thousand concurrent in January that by April we were up to fifty eight thousand and as as per the previous slide at the moment we've got around about thirty thousand online at any one point in time. One of the benefits that we had here is that uh, the company had already decided to move a lot of stuff to the cloud. So we'd already got Azure data centers, but we'd already got Teams. Who, there was a big call last year to push for Teams to go live at the end of January, um, which was, you know, um, uh, you could say it was great foresight. Um, you know, the fact that we moved the whole company, we were moving people off Skype and onto Teams meant that, um, again, um, as you know, has been stated by um, Steve McChrystal and Alan Jope, and Alan Jope is the chief exec, the company didn't miss a beat as we moved people from in the office to online. But then we got month end, and it's not only month end, it's quarter end. So um, it's one of the big processes that happens in the company. Um, <clears throat> And I mentioned about hairpinning, and so we had to go. We had um, a whole load of finance users who were working from home. Uh, normally, use um, the large downloads out of the various um, applications, import that data into Excel, do a whole load of analysis and everything else, and then from there they they um, they run the month end uh, service. All of a sudden, they couldn't they couldn't get the data over the network, especially if you're on um, in one of the countries where you might have a megabit per second at the best uh, best of times. So we needed to find some way to be able to enable these users. Um, we just finished building um, a virtual desktop environment for another project, um, so we we rapidly repurposed that. And over a period of uh, what, just over a week, uh, uh, we onboarded about 2,000 users, just short of 2,000 users into um, into Citrix. Um, they did their month end closure, um, and it's probably a bit of a reflect. Um, it was it was known as it was called the mother of all month end closures, uh, but also um, I'm told it was the smoothest ever month end closure. So maybe that says something about our internal um, networks that we need to uh, be looking at. And at the same time, um, where the reason we built the Citrix desktop, uh, the team managed to slip that one out. Uh, it's a project called IOPS, and they managed to slip that one out at the same time. So in the midst of transitioning the company to, uh, to working from home, uh, month end closure, uh, they also sort of slipped out that uh, they brought on uh, three new countries online in terms of this new program. And uh, yeah, it was Citrix that enabled us, uh, the Citrix technology, the virtual desktop that we built there uh, that enabled us to do that. And actually the next step on the way with that is, and that's a currently an on-prem and now we're rebuilding it in, in the cloud. So again, we can scale it really, really, really quickly. Um, that's it really. Um, in terms of, I wanted to just stick with you know, what we did as Unilever back in March and April um, in terms of moving people to, uh, you know, from the office to working from home. Uh, we've run into all sorts of things along over the past few months um, that we're still trying to fix and sort out. Um, nothing major, but every so often something crops up that uh, we have to deal with. So uh, at which point I'll stop talking and uh, 
uh, we're, we're better customers. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, perhaps firstly, uh, welcome to Robin, who's just joined us. Um, and uh, thanks uh, so much for coming along to the event. Um, Richard, you've described an extraordinary uh, series of events here. And I'm sure people will be very interested to know what happened after April, uh, what was the life after death there. Uh, but before we, we, we go on to questions, if I might just introduce Jason uh, Rivel from um, yeah. Avenard. Uh, he is actually uh, the uh, director of UK and Ireland consultancy uh, for Avenard uh, and a specialist in Microsoft security. So, uh, Jason, I think the issue here of security in a highly distributed environment, particularly one that was created at such speed, uh, must be of interest to all of us. Uh, so if you'd like to just give us a, a little thumbnail of um, what, what uh, you are experiencing in the marketplace now uh, around the issue of security uh, in a distributed environment. So over, over to yourself, Jason. Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm currently orbiting the Earth, so that's how I responded to COVID. I just got out of here as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, it's a really interesting question, and um, you know, Unilever and Richard's example is you know, a really good example of the kind of the two categories I've seen um, when it comes came to the COVID response. We had customers who were already cloud adoptive or quite mature in the cloud and that enabled them to scale very rapidly to respond to the changing um, landscapes because Richard being able to very rapidly scale up the infrastructure with that level of comfort and understanding that all of the surrounding cloud security work had already been put in place right because they were already up there and then we saw some other customers uh, who weren't as mature on their cloud journey and they really struggled to achieve that same level of scalability and adaptability. So some clients who, I mean, one example of a very large public sector organization, you know, they just couldn't, they couldn't respond. So they had to lower their security posture and actually had to enable quite sensitive access from personal devices as the only way to cope, for example. So, you know, I've seen both extremes. I have that example that I've seen and I have Richard's example, which is a really good example of how the cloud and the security around that enabled them to rapidly scale. Excellent, Jason. Any more uh, observations here? Um, I mean, to what extent has uh, have cyber attacks escalated in the last six months? So we, we've heard some news, obviously, about Oxford University uh, but you know, is this an endemic in this environment? Uh, have we opened ourselves up to uh, more uh, cyber attacks? I think, I mean, it would be brilliant to get some, some thoughts from the audience. From what, what we've seen with our, with our clients is there certainly has been a rise in, in COVID-based phishing, targeted phishing attacks. Um, we ourselves in Avenard responded very quickly with some end user training you know, to raise awareness. We made some changes to the way our emails were received to raise awareness around COVID team messaging and to, to bring about extra caution. But some of our customers, you know, we were literally on the ground firefighting with them as they struggled with phishing and, and ransomware attacks that were triggered by COVID based messaging. So we've definitely seen a spike from our perspective. Um, Sarah is with us from Microsoft as well. Hopefully she's over here on your screens as well. Otherwise that didn't work. Um, and Sarah can, can uh, if you want to introduce yourself quickly, maybe try some context from Microsoft yeah, as well. Yeah, sure. Hi everybody. Uh, Sarah Armstrong, so I'm Chief Security Advisor at uh, Microsoft. So um, just to pick up on what we've seen specifically with regarding um, cyber attacks and, and uh, COVID-19 theme laws, um, an actual fact, our um, threat intelligence team uh, have just done analysis. So what they were doing was tracking um, some of the COVID-19 threats that were coming from the UK, USA, and also Republic of Korea. 
And actually what we identified was that there is actually a change in tactic. So we've always had phishing laws. We've always had that malware. Um, cyber criminals are actually reacting to the crisis as news broke. So actually, you know, we look at the UK, the moment that Boris Johnson basically put UK into lockdown, we saw a massive increase in laws specifically perpetuating to be from HMRC, financial services, banking institutions, offering loans, um, offering all sorts of different services. With the prime example really is to try and get people to react as quickly as possible. So it's a kind of like time is off the essence type of scenario um, where you must react now, you must do this, you must do that. So that was what that's really interesting. So you know, we, we've seen all these pockets of changes that are happening as the world is changing and going in and out of lockdown. Um, and also in May, um, Microsoft actually opened up all of their COVID related threat intelligence. So they've open sourced that and made that available um, to all customers for free. Um, we've also openly shared that with our partners as well. Um, and just recently, uh, Microsoft did a covert multiple takedown um, of domains, a COVID-19 domains that had been set up. Um, across 62 countries. <laughs> um, so I think we've, we've, we've seen an increase, um, but I think really what we've really seen is it's a change in tactic as opposed to a spike. Um, but I think really it's, it's just about being vigilant to all of these things. And um, we've also, on top of that, we've seen um, a lot of um, first responders, hospitals, that kind of thing being targets for ransomware. Um, so you'd think there'd, there'd be a slight moral compass for some of the cyber criminals, but no, they're not at all. So it's something that we've had to react to, to our customers. So we're, we're looking at that threat intelligence. We're constantly monitoring networks, but also where customers um, are experiencing any kind of attack um, or any sort of malware, anything like that. We're reacting to it straight away. Thank you. So over to our audience, I'm sure uh, this has raised a number of uh, points and uh, I noticed there's certainly a number of you have got um, are part of big international organizations. I'd be interested to hear from, um, uh, let's say, uh, BAT, Mike, um, what's your, what was your experience? Was this similar to Unilever or uh, different? Um, so I'm I'm relatively new to BAT. I'm I'm just there interim at the moment. Joined on the first of June. So um, we had already gone into um, enforced remote working um, when I, when I joined the organisation. Uh, so I was remotely onboarded and, and inducted, which actually worked really well. Um, he says, touching wood, my uh, computer hardware didn't break um, or need to be replaced, which was good. But it's interesting on the, on, the, on the phishing piece, so I don't know if you're aware, maybe you are. So BAT or one arm of BAT is actually actively working on a COVID-19 vaccine at the moment. Really? So we have actually ramped up a lot of our monitoring and our threat intel in terms of uh, potential attacks, obviously in line with some of the government the N N NCSC advice that came out last week around some vulnerability, particularly around um, some certain remote access pr protocols and, and one of those we actually do use is our default VPN solution. So we, we've gone into a bit of a, um, not emergency, but a bit of a double checking activity in terms of are we fully patched and those sort of things. We are seeing an increased amount of phishing, um, not particularly targeted COVID wise, but we've seen sort of larger and larger batches of phishing emails hitting the organization as well. Um, none specifically mentioning COVID at the moment. Uh, most of them sort of uh, fake Microsoft sign-in credentials, which is the classic one to get um, are used as being an Office 365 organization. It's a very easy one for users to potentially fall for. And we're also doing a lot of work with uh, our service provider for Jitsu and also Microsoft as well to ramp up some of the Office 365 security that we've got at the moment. So we've done sort of a gap analysis between what's currently in place and what best practice says should be there and, and how we can close that gap. Um, yeah, so there's the, the, the a US arm doing this um, 
vaccine development and um i say we, we we've got sort of the monitoring ramped up to 11 uh for all of those things looking for particularly things like um login failures those type of things as well so at the moment um we're not seeing any specifically unusual activity but um i'm imagining we will in the next few weeks thank you mike are all your people still at home or are they returning to the office um so some parts of the world so we've got some of our offices in kuala lumpur the um teams are starting to return to the office not everybody in the uk no everyone's still remote um the exception being our r d offices so we've got some people back in there but again uh, much more socially distanced um in the us again most people are working from home they're looking at a phased return to work now but again it's um if people are comfortable coming into the office they can but the, i would say we're probably still up in the high 80 percent maybe even 90 percent of people still at home wow thank you um i'm actually interested gareth uh you're part of a big international organization again do, do any of the lessons learned at unilever ring true for yourself if you could just unmute yourself please gareth you need to unmute that if you can unmute Sh sean can we unmute gareth yeah that's good can you hear me now yeah perfect okay good yeah so a lot of things to do with unilever ring true um our challenge was our challenge was remote connectivity and ramping that up as quickly as possible um and we'd we we turned that around and globally in the space of about two weeks so we effectively we were initially geared up to um, support about 10 percent of our staff working out of the office at any moment in time and we obviously have to live behind so so in the organization i'm in um at a group level that's about 50 55,000 people so we have to go from about five to 55,000 people um and you know started it started where COVID started over in Asia Pac and then followed it across. But yeah, we, we ramped it up. It sounds very similar to the approach that Unilever licensed up and um, provided that access. And um, the model up until then had been hub centric and, and then out to all the countries. We actually implemented it into the countries and we're now wondering why we never did that in the first place because yeah. it's so much quicker and, and a much better approach. So um that's been a big boon but yes we we responded to that very very well um, thankfully over the last few years we have put a lot of emphasis on laptops people having laptops uh specifically for bcp and dr to make it um so some might say we saw you know in in, in such an event that we have that flexibility so the biggest the biggest challenge we have as an organization is uh we have a you know we're a advertising agency we do a lot of creative stuff that often is that often requires some fairly powerful rendering desktop devices and um it's how we made those available to uh those creatives that needed them a lot of them have laptop equivalents at home or sometimes desktop equivalent equivalents at home we did ship quite a few bits of the top end equipment out to our end users into their homes so they could be they could operate but generally generally we um we found that through fair means or foul we didn't rely so much on on citrix like unilever we generally move the equipment to where people are and um and touch wood we continue to work that way very similar um we're in the situation where much of china and asia pack is heading back or is back um the rest of the world most of us are most of us are being told don't expect to come back for at least another two months um if not longer and there are serious conversations about how much how many people will eventually come back so the real estate people are already looking for down our offices so it's going this has led to a, a fairly significant change in many of our bigger offices um and that's one of the more fascinating things to come out of it i'm sure no very common experience gareth i'm just looking at our two friends from uh, the uh, insurance sector paul from axa uh 
also a very large organization. How did you cope uh, with, um, with that transition? Yeah, so I, I suppose for Axel Excel, it, it's actually quite a good story. So, so very similar to Gareth, where, where our, our BCP DR capabilities as it relates to end users is, is predominantly laptops. And we have a, um, a fair amount of VDI already um, or as well, which is about 3,000 endpoints. So we're about 10,000 users on a global basis. So um, it was, it was, I suppose it was actually quite a, a good case to actually show that um, infrastructure can actually deliver a, uh, you know, a, a COVID day one experience in, in a relatively uh, good way. So one of the things I think we did in, was it late February, I've been very early March, um, our, our London campus, which is probably one of our largest campuses, we, we forced everybody to work from home just, just to test our resiliency around our, our, our VPNs and so forth. Um, that worked very well. Um, I think the, the only other change we did in preparation for, you know, everybody work from home was we, we did these standards um, split, split DNS, and, uh, uh, split, sorry, split VPN on our um, network endpoints to actually make sure our voice video breaks out at home rather than hairpin it back through our data centers. Um, I think that was the only the only minor tweak we made to our overall plans, um, and that actually gave the um, you know gave us a very good experience. Um, we we recently had a, a what we call a pulse survey, and uh, the level of confidence of people working from home is at, at a new high, which is great. Um, fortunately, we did, we did a Teams transition late last year um, alongside an integration of two other opcos as part of an AXA integration. So it, you know, it's been a pretty busy time for, for all of us. Um, but um, it's actually been a been quite a good story. The um, and other things we have done on top of that, um, certainly a fair bit of end user communications in terms of uh, remote support, um, how to do the join and move the lever process in a completely remote scenario. I'm sure that's very typical for many of us on the call. Um, alongside that, um, I, I suppose we uh, took a, a new look at our risk register, identified anything in terms of um, uh, any risks that have been sitting there, which is on the on the low list or, or doesn't have to be done just just yet list. Um, you know, some of those got re-raised and reprioritized given a completely disconnected working from home scenario. So um, things like off net browsing when not VPN got addressed. So um, that, that was always on the to-do list. It got the final push, um, a little, little, little bit more funding always helps. Uh, so so the, we, we use um, Cisco heavily. So uh, we used a Cisco umbrella to help out to just patch up some of those holes um, so that's been um, that's been quite a good piece of work for us um, I suppose looking forward there's some very active discussions um, again it's kind of echoed here by, by Gareth in terms of our real estate um, so I think we'll probably we probably won't go back to work the way we have been working uh, it's probably fair to say in some of the main campuses we're actually looking to refit and consolidate hit new ratios of um, you know, um, how many desks per user uh, and actually looking as part of our overall uh, move to cloud and um, move to much more cloud um, um, you know based infrastructure um, change of working um, offices into much more into a collaboration type of effect um, so we're looking at uh, uh, wayfinding and um, who, who's sitting where and all, all those usual digital workplace um, ecosystem pieces uh, as part of a as a return to work and it's, we're, we're looking at least for the UK probably September time before people start to come back to work to office uh, and any any real um, any real rate excellent um, all of these stories add up to a really significant change in the way we're organizing ourselves for the future um, I'd be really interested in uh, some of the, our more local uh, organizations. Um, Matt uh, from John Lewis, uh, how, uh, you, you've uh, obviously had enormous demands placed on you by your customers in uh, recent months. How, how how's a home-based workforce coped with that? Yeah, um, I think pretty well, to be honest, um, overall. <laughs> um, so we had, uh, I think, a bit like most of the other organizations that have spoke, we went through some dry runs initially. Uh, I, I took my my team through a dry run of running a SOC from remotely. Or were we capable of operating? Uh, the technology part of the business went through their own uh, uh, tests so whether they could run from home. And then we settled into what looked like fairly normal activities for everybody in March and April. Uh, yeah, and then our business needed to scale. So for I think what's more interesting for me is not how different organizations have made the technology work, but 
Yep. Actually, the pace of decision making and action, the, the, yes. the management changes that have been happening. I was listening to, to Richard's conversation earlier. I, I think it would be no surprise to anybody that we can make VPN technology allow external people to get in or for hubs to broker lots of lots of connections as they come through. That's you know, what they're designed for. The thing that's always held us back is the persuasion and the business case and the motivation for doing it at any sort of pace, let alone over the, the, the couple of days that Richard was given. And, and that's really what I've seen. So uh, uh, if we talk about the partnership specifically, they've, they've, they've bought online new delivery centers in a matter of weeks, where previously it had taken months, if not years, to decide that they should do it, let alone to go and execute it. Um, and that's not that they were bad before, that was just, that was the normal case of business. You consider the decisions well, you analyze so that you didn't make errors. Um, we, like every other business, I think over the last few months have said, well, it looks right and it feels right and it smells right, so let's go and do it. And if it's wrong, then we'll look back and learn something and move forward. You know, all of the stuff we've given lip service to for, for many years, we actually started doing it. Um, we took online completely new propositions, uh, uh, a sort of local delivery service like Deliveroo or that sort of stuff, partnership yeah. lacking one. We, we took it from an idea to live and running in three weeks. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it's just, it, you wouldn't have considered that as even possible, let alone doing it um, in that short time frame. So the, the real big lesson for me isn't that remote access works or that VPN is a good idea or hairpinning something to watch out for there's some nuances in there the real decision the real learning is you know we can we can make decisions and do things a lot quicker than we've probably given ourselves credit for historically i mean matt that's absolutely fascinating uh, that's come through from a number of cio net members that uh all the bureaucracy all the rules have been brushed aside you've just got to get on with it quickly and it, it's all a question of days and weeks rather than months and years uh, but that does actually raise some issues around security, does it not? Um, sure. You are uh, beginning to take some risks. Uh, and uh, one of you mentioned, I think it was maybe Paul, about reviewing the ri risk register. Uh, you know, how is it possible to maintain governance and control in a, a situation where, as you say, an idea to implementation takes days? Um, you know, wh where's the control? Um, and and how, what's management's attitude here? Yeah. So I can talk for what we've done. We, we've specifically changed risk assessment processes that would have taken days or weeks and been incredibly thorough and ironed out risks before we went live to to become hours, uh, days at most, where they become an assessment of risk. So we make a decision knowing what the risk is, well, rather than put all our efforts in removing it. I think it's it's um, it's a bit like we've been holding onto a comfort blanket or a, a sort of protective view of everything. We've got to fix as much as we can, rather than well, sometimes it's okay to go with a bit more risk than uh, yeah we might naturally do. And it's had some fairly fairly uh, significant um, repercussions. So we are carrying a lot more risk than we would have done in the past, but. What I'm saying is actually that that's proven out to be the right decision to have taken. We would have we would have suffered significant business impact if we'd have carried on running in our old way. You know, I'm up in, not meaning to big up sort of John Lewis's role in all of this, but the, the nation would have suffered uh, yep. uh, if all of our market and and various other industries acted in the same way. Um, you know, a bigger risk appetite was very necessary. Excellent, Matt. David, I'm interested in your experience in the education sector. I'm, presumably, you've also gone through some big transitions. Yeah, I mean, the education sector is probably one of the most difficult changes, isn't it? It's a cultural change. Teachers, typically, I mean, I'm in a college that's it's further education, so most of our students are 16 to 19. Some of them are doing traditional skills, A-levels, O-levels. Many of them, though, are doing things like woodworking, hairdressing, vocational skills, very important skills for society. Yeah, absolutely. And teachers are not used to teaching those using this technology. So although we, we, we were well prepared in that we'd rolled out Office 365, we had teams, 
We had all the technology ability to deliver teaching. What we didn't have was the workforce who were experienced in how to deliver a lesson online. How do you do it? How do you, uh, you could probably, probably a long time ago, all of us we were at school, but how do you manage a, a classroom situation when it's partly online? And we've now got to this stage where we are going to do proper blended learning. We are going to design our courses in the future so that they can either be completely online, blended learning, some parts online, some parts face to face, and indeed the merged bit. So some lessons will be taught to people in class at the same time as being taught online. So a sort of broadcast and a, an in-class thing. And it's quite difficult. And the problem the sector faces is finance. Clearly finance for any business is tight. But you can imagine the, uh, if you like, IT allowances given per student in a, an education situation is quite low. Yeah. And so the other challenge we face is we might be able to do all of this, but if the student themselves doesn't have the technology at home, they mm -hmm. can't receive the learning. Yeah. So a large, a large cohort of our students, for whatever reason, are from a sector where they, 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 don't, they either can't afford a laptop, they can't yeah. afford, even maybe don't have an internet connection. And so how do you face all of that without support from the government? So we are very much looking forward to hearing what the uh, Chancellor has to say, because he is talking, it's talking up the need to, shall we say, catch up on education, particularly those at that critical 16 to 18 year olds. Um, they need to have something that they can grab onto and something they can, they can do. But we faced all the same challenges that perhaps at a small scale, whereas someone like Unilever had to roll out 50,000. Well, we, we didn't have 50,000, but we, we, had, we certainly had 20,000 students that we had to do something for, some of which it was the traditional print, print workbooks out, send them around, hand them over and say, read these and we'll, we'll mark them. But the online thing has, has worked well. The challenge we face, and I guess all, all, of, all of us face, is what, from a security perspective, what do you allow a home user to connect to with their own device? Remember, this might be a device that we've never seen, we've, not, we've never touched, could be running who knows what operating system, really. Um, yeah. So that's a difficult challenge. I mean, you know, what's really levels mentioned. of protection? Yeah, no one's really mentioned the whole uh, bring your own device, yeah. uh, bring your own everything. Uh, I'd be really interested to come back to that. Uh, Robin, I think you were smiling a little bit uh, at some of those comments. I mean, uh, how, how are you coping as a you know, leading finance organization with some pretty important clients, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether, um, whether to, to talk about the challenges or the positives. Uh, <laughs> both, both, is. please. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the challenges... Um, we had a push towards a bring your own device um, scenario in the last year or so. Um, so we had a whole lot of laptops that were coming to end of life. And as a security officer, I wanted to replace them. Um, but they said, no, we're gonna be, um, you know, people will be able to use their own devices. So it turns out that um, people don't buy laptops and computers for home anymore. They mostly just buy tablets, um, et cetera. So they weren't able to, you know, so within the, the two week time frame before um, working from home, before the 20th of March, we were out during that period buying about 50 different laptops, I think, and setting them up. Um, so that was one thing that wasn't so great. Um, but it happened and it happened really quickly so that was a positive. Um, some people actually don't live in an area that has got decent reception so they can't use video conferencing. Mm. Um, we have to do telephone conferences with those people. Um, so you know they've just got very limited bandwidth yeah. so they can you know connect to emails and, and make phone calls etc but that's it. Um, other people are not enjoying you know they haven't been able to work from home very well if they're living in a shared house um, yeah. you know, they don't have room to set up a um, set up a desk to work from 
and you know especially with childcare and, and things like that um, so they are the challenges but um, and we actually got everybody working successfully from home within within a week or so um, so that was really really amazing we were quite pleased how, how that all worked out um, there's some applications that we couldn't access um, some legacy applications that you couldn't deploy over the VDI. So we uh, enabled those users to um, remote back to their, their desktops. Um, and so that fixed that problem. Um, where security-wise printing, we haven't allowed people to print from home. I still won't allow it. <laughs> um, if they want to print, it has to be on a case by, you know, there has to be an exception. So if there is certain users that need to print, they can be signed off by, you know, the, the senior person in the company. Um, mm. Otherwise, if it's just a one-off, we can do it for them. Um, and the reason behind that is that security issues are on printing. Yeah, I mean, we've we've got um, we've we wouldn't want people to be able to print off client lists. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with you know contact details, net worth, all that sort of things. Um, sure. Otherwise, um, yeah. The at the office at the moment, it's it's shut down in the city. Um, we're probably on any day. We've maybe got two people in the office, um, and that's because they can walk to work. We're doing pulse surveys now, once every two weeks. So once every two weeks, we're sending out surveys to all staff. It's only like four questions about how they, you know, do you want to return? Are you happy to take public transport? Um, so the first one started at the beginning of the month and um, the last one, you know, people were warming up to the idea of returning to the office. It's getting a bit, bit better. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's plenty I could talk about, but um, it depends what uh, if there's anything in particular you wanted to to, to know. Sure, sure, sure. No, I mean that's a very interesting, good summary. Um, I'm just thinking we there are a couple of other people who haven't spoken yet. So Pablo, uh, how about yourself in uh, the insurance business? A any uh, differences or uh, uh, agreements with what what you've heard so far? Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of overlaps with what um, um, Richard and Gareth and Paul have spoken about. So the trajectory, uh, we're a global organization as well. So our trajectory is very similar, right? So um, we went with most people working on premise um, to working at home. And culturally, that's been mixed, right? So our American colleagues, for the most part, are used to working from home, many situations and would you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't come in. So to be fair, they actually were very useful in the way that we set up our networks and all the rest of it. Um, I think our choice of the technology is very similar. Um, and echoing what Paul said, um, something that was generally taken for granted, not that well considered. I mean, you, it's kind of interesting how the attention had always been about what technology change we were going to do as opposed to the really boring stuff, which is Teams and Microsoft SharePoint and AD and da, 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 da. As it turns out, all of those things set us up really well. Mm -hmm. So if I think about the fact that, that um, you know, we've got quite a large call center in the Philippines, mm -hmm. really bad network connection, terrible internet and all the rest of it. Um, we've managed to, can, you know, keep working in many ways seamlessly um and i guess echoing in some way some of the discussion around what does it mean going forward do we physically need to be at home well uh, sorry at work my mind's up i'll probably go nuts if i don't go back to the office but it has certainly um drawn out some very traditional operating models like the lawyers of london one where mm. it's very face to face with big dossiers yep. is that really relevant anymore so mm -hmm. again people could connect into us you know we're easy to do business you, you know hit us up on teams whatever else but you, you, you don't need to be carrying this dossier around to do business around you know you know that conversational approach really. so that i think things have changed and um in many ways i quite like the way that 
you know, you'd summarised it, um, Matt, by saying um, the decisions that were being made before that took ages are now very quick. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's um, I think it's kind of cool. But what pings in my mind is like obviously it's quite expensive, right? So what does it mean going forward? Um, and you know, actually, um, is it that thing that we've all needed to change culture? Mm-hmm. So is this is this a really good in to say all right for the last how many months? That, that, that this has worked quite well, um, nothing's really gone wrong, or is this, you know, a really good opportunity to say, actually, there's a really good trajectory that we're on now that we, you know, should we settle down? And I hope we do soon, right? Um, what does this mean for our culture? Can we actually pivot? Can we be more agile? We've always wanted to be, and as it turns out, we have had to be through necessity. Um, is this is this a trajectory we can go? So look, in my mind, so that, I think that that's that's a great, outcome if we can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, and Kevin from WH Smith, uh, another well-known name in the high street. So how, how yes, have you been um, coping? I, I probably have a quite bizarre story here. Um, so when I was at Smith, I was helping them um, revamp their IT. So there's a number of things. Um, and the message I would say that I picked up from this is, is IT taking more of a role in anticipating and pushing things through. So, for example, um, at WH Smith, um, they weren't utilising Office 365 that well. Um, so we kicked off a project uh, 12 months ago to get that, so we take the full use of it across the, and we started to get good traction within the group. Um, and security, it was, um, some parts of it were extremely good, as you can imagine, with stores, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah. But some parts of it, um, probably wasn't uh, revamped, re-looked at, refreshed as quickly as it should have been done. So again, we started, started on that and that was one of the things we pushed. But the most bizarre part was um, remote working. And I used to work for NBC Universal Pictures, which is a multinational. And my observation moving from that sector into this is global companies are far better placed to um, for remote working, agile working, culturally, and also uh, from a organisation. I include not just IT there, but from uh, uh, helping people people to do it. So, um, going back on um, Richard with Unilever, massive, massive step ups, and knew the way by which to do it. My observation, and it could just be Smiths, was um, working from home. Mm, no. And where this comes to, one of the other transformations I was doing from was um, they were selling off half of their real estate in Swindon, head office, to um, um, uh, sell off to a house builder. Um, and what they were moving from was 600 car parking spaces to less than 200, which presented a problem for the workforce. They'd have no... So they were actually looking at car parking space. And last October, I said, look we should actually make it available that people can work from home. Uh, no name for pack drills. I had about three or four people from other parts of business saying, we don't do remote working. We want people in the office. So I went back anyway to the, um, uh, the group operating office and said, look, we need to do this because what's going to happen is come April the 23rd, there will not be enough spaces for people and they'll have to work from home. And if we're not ready, then... It's IT's problem again. So we embarked on getting remote working going, um, looking at all the security firewall sets up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then when it hit in early March, middle of March, they said, well, how long will it take? We were able to do it in 24 hours. 24 wow. hours. So it was, uh, you know, it, uh, the timing could not have been better. Having gone through things, so even laptops where... Um, again, embarked on a refresh from moving from desktop to laptops to give more of that uh, maneuverability for people. Um, just finished the rollout update of all the people for, with laptops at the beginning of March. So it was very, very fortuitous. But that fortuitous was a big push from the IT group yeah. last year to do it rather than just wait to do it. Um, 
I mean, what would be interesting, I think it's Pablo when you're saying about uh, Philippines, uh, two help desks at WH Smith um, on the Philippines, and we were worried about the uh, connectivity, but that was uh, the help desk for the stores. So, of course, all the stores are closed, apart from ones in the hospitals. So it was less of a link. So the big challenge WH Smith are going to have is as they open up more and more stores and you get more footfall, more traction, et cetera, uh, how well the Philippines one works. But the other thing um, I, I would like to say is um, what we saw was the leadership culture. Previously, mm -hmm. it was, no, no, we want to see people's faces, the political uh, culture of, of being seen as well. Um, and I've seen it in, not even when I was at NBC, no, no, we want, we want people in the office. I think this is a game changer on the culture of leadership, embracing um, working from home. Uh, the other thing as well is the productivity is unproductive. There's always the argument I used to get thrown at me was, we have people at home, how we know they're productive? Well, actually, from a lot of people I've spoken to, this, the problem is people are working too long hours. Yeah. And it's trying to find that balance on that well-being. So, uh, and I think it's here to stay. Uh, I think we've all said about real estate, et cetera. I mean, you've got a very ready-made one there with W.A. Smith. Um, and it brings new challenges, um, not just technical ones, but uh, real estate and HR and well-being of people. And the political culture. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm very familiar with W.A. Smith. I remember their head office in Swindon very well. And they're, they're moving out, or they've moved out, have they? So, uh, well, they had two parts in the one with the big tower, yeah, and yeah. the other side. So they sold the other side, two hundred houses they sold there. So, um, uh, uh, and, and the, the other part of this is the the builder would not allow them to extend beyond April twenty third. So we halfway through moving everyone, didn't get it finished, and literally um, vendors not been able to turn up. Uh, it was, um, and we had to hand it over with absolutely nothing in it. So uh, you can imagine it was uh, um, quite, quite, but we did it. We did it. So. Andy, uh, I've saved you to last, but I'm sure you've got plenty stored up for us. Uh, what, what, what do you make of all this? I mean, it, it all sounds pretty good news, actually. Um, I think the technologies were in place. Uh, cloud has really helped. Um, but are we, are we facing new problems, new challenges? Uh, perhaps. I, I think, um, yeah, thanks for saving me for last. That's very kind, Roger. Um, <laughs> uh, Any time. Uh, I think what Pablo was talking about, culture was resonating with me, actually. And, and one of the things that strikes me is, so we're in a fortunate position. We, we have like 100 users rather than 100,000 users. So a mm -hmm. slightly easier challenge to deal with. And... Um, Actually, we're, we're, we're cloud only as well, so we didn't really have the challenge. You know, we work on client side a lot. Yeah. And as you've got quite a, a bit of a younger workforce as well, so they're just kind of, they're used to it already. And, and the thing that struck, struck me there is that there was a few kind of, because everyone's digital transformations were just kind of accelerating, delivering all those things we've been trying to do for years were just happening a matter of weeks. And, and I think there were certain things like, um, you know, there was a there was a shift with um, Skype and Teams functionality, wasn't there, back in March, wasn't there? Which all of a sudden, they, all, all the kind of external calls became uh, accessible through Office 365 on Teams. Yeah. And um, it, you know, we we've had Teams for a number of years now. We've tried and failed with predecessors like Yammer and so on like that. But actually, it was that kind of getting off Skype and into the one platform drove everyone onto it. And we're having daily stand-ups rather than weekly SLT calls now on Teams, and everyone's really using the platform properly. So um, that was a, a good side effect from a kind of productivity perspective. Um, but I think one of the things that on my mind is that, you know, we're all kind of getting used to these tools, but I actually think some of the younger generations, they've moved on to the next generation of tools already. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All these developers are on Discord and other kind of platforms in collaborating there. And it's like, Things we've not heard of, and we've kind of got a bit of a job on our hands trying to put some rigor into what they want to do, so without stifling their creativity, right? But but ultimately, they can't just turn up with a random tool that we know nothing about. As well, interesting finding some balance there. Um, and from a security perspective, there, there was another kind of emerging category. Well, I don't know if anyone's got a, a view of in the room. This is the first one I've come across where um, the startup that I 
seen come across my radar, uh, was looking at firmware security, which was an interesting one because um, lots of us have been out there procuring laptops from uh, unusual means, probably, uh, and um, there's a little bit of a risk, you know, it may be in a kind of supply chain compliance and that kind of physical endpoint management. So it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, firmware security is, is, is crept on some of your agendas because um, it was a, certainly a new concept for me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and just to, just to come back, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the meeting, and I know some people have joined us slightly later on, everybody here has been sent an SMS uh, text, and that's for our feedback, but also to vote for the most valuable participant. Now, I know the conversation hasn't ended, but uh, if we could uh, have a look at that um, uh, now, it's, it's very quick and easy. Um, there will be a number of photos on there of, of, of participants, but whoever you feel has provided the most uh, value uh, from uh, the participants today. If you could uh, start voting on that, uh, that, that would be absolutely super. It also helps us, as I say, um, improve our events, which uh, happens all the time. So, Roger. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Yes, if you could please do that, that's really helpful to us. And while you're doing it, perhaps, uh, Sarah, if I can come back to yourself. I know Microsoft's a very large organization and in the last six months, I guess a lot has changed within your own company. Uh, where have the priorities been? Um, let me do a bit of scene setting, I think, and um, just talk about how prepared Microsoft was pre-COVID. Um, so Microsoft has the biggest cloud um, uh, environment of any provider. Um, it spans 160. Uh, data centers worldwide. Um, we've got 151 kilometer, thousand kilometers of uh, network. So that's Microsoft owned or Microsoft leased. So point to point, it all goes across a Microsoft network. We don't go across the internet at all. Um, and all of those data centers are built within the sort of availability zones. So it enables customers to think about how they would manage their business continuity, disaster recovery, any data sovereignty issues that they may have for data protection, those type of things. And um, Microsoft's done a lot of work in terms of fault tolerance and redundancy. So even if we think about you know, climate change, um, we've been thinking about how do we operate to extremes? So how do we operate if we were to go to extreme cold versus extreme heat? Um, and obviously in terms of how we manage cloud, um, so we're not just, so we've got Office 365, we've got Azure, We've got Dynamics and we've also got Xbox Live running across all of those things simultaneously. And at any one point, we are running 24 seven. Um, we're reacting to individual customer needs and demands. We're reacting to seasonal demands. So, you know, if there's religious festivals, that kind of thing, regional incidents. Um, and obviously COVID really put that to the test. <laughs> um so i think you really so we, we we've kind of got that resilient backbone is what we kind of say um we're not dependent on the internet um so any issues with bandwidth and those type of things um don't affect microsoft in that way um all of our customer services are connected through one links directly through their network providers um, so as much as possible we're trying to take that traffic off the internet um, so what did Microsoft do? Um, so Microsoft's head office is in uh, Redmond, um, just outside Seattle. Um, approximately 40,000 people there. Um, 156,000 people worldwide. Um, so the first recorded death in the USA um, was at the end of February. Um, that was um, within about 20 miles of Redmond. Um, so within a couple of weeks, Microsoft made the decision that they were going to shut down every single Microsoft office worldwide. Um, so 98% of all of our users ended up working remotely. Um, so only essential workers were still available. Um, so most of our data centers around dark site. Um, but obviously we've got engineers, we've got people who need to react. Um, if there are any incidents um, and those type of things. Um, so Microsoft as a company, everything that we do, everything that we sell, <laughs> um, is, is what we do for ourselves. So Microsoft runs on Microsoft, um, as, as you'd probably expect. 
Um, and uh, there was a couple of things already in flight um, pre-COVID. Um, so one of those things was that we'd already made the decision that we were going to go 100% cloud. Um, I think we were there or thereabouts at that point. Um, so that made life a lot easier. Um, we'd already set up most of our users for remote access capabilities, although we do have some users who are desktop users. So I think we have the same challenges with regards to how do we enable those users as, as quickly as possible. Um, so one of the things that we were able to do very quickly was to set up um, virtual desktop. Um, we also had a, a mass shortage of devices. Um, so as you can imagine, customers were <laughs> all of a sudden putting in uh, lots of orders, um, which obviously created a shortage um, worldwide. So any devices that may have been provisioned for Microsoft users, we gave them all up. <laughs> um, and enable bring your own device. So um, in actual fact, um, we, uh, we've got the capabilities obviously within the Microsoft infrastructure. Um, we use Intune. Um, so we're able to set up all of those devices for um, mobile device management and remote capabilities. Um, also, um, fortuitously, um, pre-COVID, we'd also been um, looking at our VPN um, so as some people have said, um, we deploy split tunneling. Um, so all of our cloud um, services go straight off out. Um, and only a very, very small amount of um, on-prem services remain, as I said. Um, so actually there's very, very little traffic um, that actually goes through our data centers at all. Um, we've enabled um, that zero trust architecture. Um, which enables us to put up that um, trusted environment into the cloud. Um, every single user is set up for multi-factor authentication. Um, so we've been able to keep Microsoft up. Um, so we have three challenges. We keep Microsoft up. Um, we, how do we keep our existing customers up? And obviously, um, new customers um, suddenly um, went onto the cloud and it, it, it extreme speed. <laughs> um, and most of those I think were um, already in some kind of um, transformation. Um, and actually um, Satya Nadella, our CEO, he observed that we've seen two years of transformation in two months. Um, a lot of that has been uh, enabling teams. Um, so actually we've got at the moment just over 75 million concurrent users. Um, approximately 2 billion of um, active minutes a day. Um, and on top of that, you now as we sort of said, uh, I mean, Microsoft as an entity is the second most attacked entity in the world um, from cyber attacks. Um, only um, second to the US Department of Defense, possibly, <laughs> maybe. Um, but it's either, you know, if you're not attacking Microsoft, you're attacking our customers. Um, so as we sort of said is, so not only are we monitoring the cloud, we're monitoring all of the devices, we're, we're, mo we're monitoring authentications. Um, we see 8 trillion signals a day, um, which is, you know, to cut through all that noise, um, we use a lot of machine learning, of um, um, analytics, and we turn that into actual intelligence. So. A lot of that is um, proactively fed back down through all of the Microsoft services. So we automate a lot of the updates, patching, those type of things. Um, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's been quite involved. And actually, you know, um, most of my, a lot of my colleagues are actually saying they're busier now than they ever have been. Um, and to kind of reflect on some of the comments that have been made. I mean, um, I think culturally, um, it's always about you know, customers um, come first. Um, that's really important. But also we are engaging, we're enabling, we're listening um, you know, to all of the feedback from our customers. All of that is fed back through our product teams. Um, so even on Teams alone, um, it's, you know, it's even looking at how many of the little video boxes um, we've got concurrently to enable that crisis management and what have you so it's just little things little things like that but it makes a massive difference in terms of you know when you're managing a crisis and all of those things but i think we are actively sharing all of those lessons learned um for free um to all our customers and even non-customers through our website 
Um, and actually what we've been reflecting on is that, you know, that wellness, the productivity um, is really critical. Um, and even to the point where it's like an observation where if you're in the office, you know, sometimes it's just that walking between an office, you know, between meetings, even if you're back to back, there's little few minutes in between, it's just enough for you to just think about, oh, I was going to get a cup of tea, I'll just, you know, think about something else. So actually Microsoft are encouraging, you know, don't have one hour meetings, shorten them to 50 minutes, 25 mm -hmm. minutes, with all of those type of things. So it's, yeah, it's like I say, it, it's quite involved. Um, it, we're, we're constantly learning, constantly adapting um, to what's going on. And obviously a lot of our customers um, that have accelerated through transformation, um, even they would, some of those would admit themselves, they may have bypassed some of their traditional governance, maybe some of their security controls. They're trying to force their on-prem policy process into a cloud environment. It doesn't quite work. It's a little bit clunky. So now we are retrospectively working with our customers to then make sure that we're closing all those gaps off. Um, but even as customers are then thinking about what's next. So we think we're already thinking ahead, you know, post post COVID, um, how, are, how are companies and customers adapting to this change and Microsoft included. Um, and I think to, to the point that other people are saying, we are also thinking about our own footprint in offices and enabling actually more and more people to work remotely as well. Thank you very much, Sarah. I mean, one point that came up uh, recently was the idea of a level playing field, which actually said, uh, do people have the same level of access, the same capabilities at home as they would in an office? And should you actually discriminate against people at home because uh, it's easier to provide all those services in an office. I don't know whether any, any one of you has been thinking about that. I mean, how, how do you provide a level playing field in the sense that quite a few people will certainly want to stay at home for part of the week, if not the whole week? Um, any comments on that one from any of you? Is there already a, a level playing field is really the, the question. Robin, have you had any views on uh, do do unmute, please? Sure. Um, I think I've already mentioned about the printing. Um, yeah. I, I, ideal. Well, it's, it's difficult because as a security person, I don't want people in an environment that I can't control having access to the 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 investment or personal wealth of our clients right. um, i don't know if they live in shared houses i don't know who they share yeah. a house with um you know you don't always know um if if their their partner works for a competitor or not um so i mean that's that that's uh something to be aware of when you're working in a financial asset management firm um, but other industries I can see it's not really you know it's not an issue. How about yourself Gareth you you mentioned that uh, you're you know a lot of your people are very creative they probably need uh, quite sophisticated uh, computing capabilities can you provide that in a home environment or is it really still back to the office? We have we've moved we've moved a lot of it to um, to people's homes. Um, whether how how you know whether that will be a long term thing as we don't see them come back. I mean I, I do think that the people who need the power and they need you know when, when you're developing ad campaigns or um, you know the, the type of files we're working with are just huge. And mm -hmm. what we've geared up is is based around connectivity from the office. So we have to look at um, you know, whether that does mean that we can facilitate that in people's homes through various different technologies or those will be the people that will come back. So um, you know, th th those are the type of discussions that, that, um, that, that we're talking about. Um, but I, I, yeah, aside from that, I mean, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I'm, you know, I had, I've always worked from home and I, therefore I've invested in, Good internet connectivity but I do have to remember I think by those comments that we had is there are lots of people who have some huge challenges out there 
mm -hmm. connectivity. Um, you know, they don't live in uh, they don't live in a world of fiber. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, you know, we have to we have to take that into consideration. But um, my company in particular has been very involved in just making sure that we are people are comfortable with that if they want to come back in. I do know some people who are ha absolutely sick of being at home with their families. Yeah. Um, home tutoring yeah. is not what they thought it might be. Um, they just don't have the facilities available and they just want to come back to work. They just want to get, a, get, get back to a more focused space, as they call it. So um, I, I, we'll see. But I think that's it. I think in our world, it's more about people's choice. We've got lots of other people who just don't want to go anywhere near London or anywhere near you know, the, 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 the big offices. They don't want to travel on public transport. So it's, it's each to their own. Um, so I think as employers, we have to be understanding and flexible and, and see if they can, you know, support them and make them as, uh, make them as effective as they possibly can be. David, of course, you mentioned the issues of, uh, your students, not necessarily having computers of any kind at home, uh, not even having internet connections at home. I'm actually quite familiar with this in the teaching world. Uh, it, it, it's very problematic, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, a society problem as well. We've got lots of uh, families as well where you might have four children at home, you know, aged between seven and 14 or 18. And all of them are trying to receive education from their respective schools or further education or even university. Yeah. Um, now, not many families of that size probably have got four laptops or six laptops and all competing for the same connectivity that their parents are perhaps using as well to work from home. So it is difficult. I don't really know what the answer is. One of my friends is trying to get a system. You know how we have food banks yeah. for people yeah. who need more food? Um, there's a lot of unused connectivity on your mobile phone these days at the end of the month you might and i mean some of the providers like sky you can roll over your mobile unused mega megabytes or whatever um whether the the carriers could you could donate that capacity yeah. to to someone and then students could apply for it and then because that's the problem even if they use their, a lot of them have got a mobile phone yeah but they probably only got you know a small amount of capacity which means if they were to use that phone for learning they would probably use it up in a, a couple of uh, lessons per, per day that would be it so it's how do we give that access uh, or whether the government provides all, all families i mean that was that was mooted with the election campaign wasn't it of one of the yep. things would the government provide a minimum level of internet connectivity i don't know these are all political decisions, though. There's nothing that I can do as the IT director to change the way people live and, and how are at home. Really. Because the college has only got so much cash to, to invest in this. And, and there are students, special needs cases, where we get extra funding and we can give them additional help, uh, including internet and, and uh, home devices. But that's only a very small percentage of the total student population, very small. Mm -hmm. Our college as well teaches um, not English to non-English non students. So that's even more difficult to do remotely. <laughs> but of course you, you have to start somewhere. So it's, it's, it's very challenging. I'm just but it's a game changer. We're not gonna go back to purely in classroom teaching. There will be more content online, there will be more on demand as well. And of course, the lecturers and the uh, instructors are all very fearful of job losses because they feel that once they've created a thing to teach a particular item, um, that could be replayed, I don't know, hundreds of times. And they're worried. The unions are very involved in this as well. And they are worried about that intellectual property. Who owns it? Because let's face it, if you teach someone how to solve a quadratic equation, it's going to be the same this year as it is next year as it is the year after. However, if you're teaching someone on fashion design, the designs change and the, the tastes change. So I guess there is something. But 
some subjects don't change do they over over life but that that's the challenge the, the business faces and it, it's probably worse for further education than it is in in some some areas because the type of the children are tech savvy and they the other problem you get is the disruptiveness in class just as it used to be at school with people online you've got to put the right controls on your teams so that people don't um interrupt or post videos halfway through or something like that so Thank that, you, that holds what challenge I think you're throwing out here to perhaps Microsoft actually is, is that as people upgrade their kit and they do so in, corporately in large yeah. volumes, uh, I'm sure that the uh, old generation of kit still has some value uh, for uh, students. I mean, I, I used to yeah. work in jitsu and uh, you know, we would take out hundreds of thousands of PCs each year and put new ones in. And you know, what happens to the old PCs? And um, they're really fairly worthless uh, in a corporate sense, but they could be valuable to students. I'm just wondering yes. sir, if that's a, that's a mission for Microsoft, given that you <laughs> probably have such a vast uh, uh, number of people using uh, your own kit. Um, you could argue it's a mission for all the big companies, really. I mean, we certainly donate a lot of our old hardware to schools and colleges in the US and so on. So I think yeah. thinking back in with the internet access, is there a broader socioeconomic thing emerging here where big companies should be helping out their communities, not just you know, to gain access, but to maintain it and secure it, perhaps. So, yeah, it's a yeah. big social yeah. responsibility thing emerging around this, which I think is really interesting as well. To be fair to Microsoft, they do give students free Office 365, effectively. But, of course, they've still got to have a device on which to run it. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, I'm just looking at you. How are we doing with the uh, most val valuable uh, contributor? Uh, we still have a couple more to complete, um, but if you maybe move to someone else briefly, I'm sure that will happen shortly, and uh, I'll be able to announce. Thanks. I mean, we're, we're probably well over time now, but I'll, 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 and we've been round once. Are there any? Uh, particular questions uh, that you want to ask um, either Richard or Jason or Sarah? Um, any, any unanswered questions? I mean, we've talked a lot about the transition, uh, but we haven't talked much about the future. Okay. I've got um, one quick question, if I could, Roger. Please do, me. Question back for Richard. Uh, are you working on any plans? I, I think this comes into your point there, Roger, as well. Are, are you already working on any plans to reverse out some of the stuff that you've put in place, or are you leave a committed that, that it's in, and it's in for good? Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that trying um, to... So yeah, we're working on Chatham House rules here, are we? So um, one of the things that VPNs do, and they're very good at connecting you to your network, but it's an open connection to the network. And some of the comments um, you know, Robin was on about, you know, you don't know who, who else is in the house, but also we don't know who else is on the device itself uh, from a phishing attack or something like that. So. Um, our thinking now is moving towards zero trust and saying, okay, so we don't just provide open access to the network, we just provide you access to one, two, three applications, what have you. So, yes, we will start to um, reverse some of the things that we're doing. Um, we are looking at, as well, um, from a cost point of view, if you look at the, you pay fixed cost for these hubs around the world. Yeah, I've got a pay-as-you-go service that I use with, um, with my, um, that's based on Azure. So why do I need to pay fixed amounts when I can, uh, if I want to scale things back, and I'm on a pay-as-you-go, I can reduce my costs as well. So we're looking at how do we start to take out the fixed hubs and move more into Azure. But at the same time, that's stage one, and then stage two is working towards a, a zero trust from a remote point of view. Um, so again, we um, tighten up the security because it's working for the moment, 
but um, I'm, I have a level of uncomfortableness, if that's a, if that's a properly constructed English uh, phrase, um, around just open VPNs coming in. Um, we've got all the tools around it, the MFA and all of that lot, but um, if somebody's on my machine, they probably don't need to authenticate to come down a VPN. So yeah, if that answers your question on that. Is that okay, Matt? Yeah. It does, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Excellent, and that uh, gives us good time that all of the results are in. Um, and in uh, joint second place is uh, Mike, uh, David, uh, Matt, and in first place is Pablo. So uh, Pablo will be in touch uh, to see what charity you'd like to make the donation to. Um, I did want to touch um, earlier on uh, the wellness uh, baskets that you guys have been sent. Um, we were going to have a, 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 a wellness and fitness uh, demonstration from uh, an organisation we've been working with across the whole of the CIO Net group uh, that are based out of Belgium. But because we were quite tight on the time, um, if anyone would like a demonstration, we're happy to arrange uh, a convenient time for your good selves. But uh, you should have all uh, had um, the uh, the packages live and uh, feel free to enjoy them. The resistance bands, I'm sure you all have broken them all out already and are doing wonderful things with them. But uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's just that we were slightly uh, tight on time, um, but the conversation, I'm sure everyone will agree, is, is a lot more beneficial than uh, talking about fitness etc so, uh, so yeah